representing Franchise Secrets, Eric Von Horn. If you're not a part of the Franchise Secrets Facebook group, what are you waiting for? It's FranchiseSecrets.com slash Facebook. I cannot believe how valuable this group turned out to be. When someone asks a question, the feedback is honest, authentic, very helpful, and it's from multiple perspectives. If you're not sure that you're getting the most accurate information about franchising, then check out the largest, most helpful Facebook group in all of franchising. Whether you're a Z, a Zor, a buyer, or investor, join our free Facebook group at FranchiseSecrets.com slash Facebook. Welcome to the Franchise Secrets Podcast. Your host, Eric Van Horn, here today with Dr. John Hayes. He is the Titus Chair for Franchise Leadership at the Titus Center for Franchising. Since 1979, John Hayes has worked within the franchise community as a consultant, franchisee and franchisor. He's one of an elite group worldwide that has actually owned and operated franchises. He's the author of several franchise related books, countless articles that have appeared in the media worldwide. He's been a franchisee. He served as the president and CEO of Homebesters, also known as We Buy Ugly Houses. And he's been a franchisee of several concepts. He served on the board of directors for both Homebesters and the Dwyer Group. Uh, John, welcome to the show. Thank you, Eric. It's a pleasure. So what did to I keep- miss? I, I said a lot of stuff, but I know I missed like way more. So fill in the uh-huh. gaps. Uh, you know, I don't know that any of that matters uh, to <laughs> your audience. Uh, 40 years I've been in franchising. I got in it to, by accident. Franchising threw itself at me. A franchisor called one day when I was a teaching writing. I was the head of the magazine writing program at Temple University in Philadelphia. Franchisor called and said, I want you to write a book about franchising. I laughed and said, I don't even know what it is and I don't know how to spell it. So I don't think I'm going to write a book about it. But as he uh, told me more and I did a little research, I found out nobody had written a book about franchising uh, in 1979. And so I did the work for a, a book that we called Franchising the Inside Story. It's essentially the story of franchising at that time and how to buy a franchise. And there was also a chapter on how to franchise your business. And I did it for a $10,000 fee, which is I was writing books at the time for business people. If you want to be taken seriously as a business person, write a book. And then the media will say, you are the world expert. I wrote that book. The media said, up next is John Hayes, the world authority on franchising. I would laugh, barely knew how to spell the word, never owned a franchise, never worked for a franchisor at the time, never worked for a franchisee at the time, just spent six months interviewing 100 people about franchising and wrote a book, and that made me the world authority. 40 years later, I'd say it's probably fair to call me a world authority because I've been around the world with franchising I've run them. I've run franchises. I've worked for many, many, many franchisors in consulting capacities. I've uh, written numerous more books. Uh, I spend most of my time educating people about franchising. I'm at Palm Beach Atlantic University in West Palm Beach, where I've got 60 students who are earning a concentration in franchising, along with a business degree. Um, That's what I do. And uh, I'm happy to be on your podcast. I love it. So you wrote the book before you were the expert, and then it only took you 40 years to become the expert. To earn that title. (laughs) To earn that title. Yeah. Did you feel, uh, like, serious question, back then, did you feel like an imposter? A lot of people struggle with imposter syndrome. Did you feel like an imposter? Did you feel educated? Well, I knew a lot about franchising. You know, you spend six months, you talk to 100 people, you write a book, you are going to know a lot about a topic. But I had just done that the previous book was How to Win Productivity in Manufacturing. Who would want to read about that? Uh, the previous book was Divorce, Your Fault, My Fault, No Fault for a, an attorney in Pennsylvania who was wanted to be the world authority on no-fault divorce. Um, the book before that was uh, Taming Your Turmoil, uh, How to Resolve the Transitions of Adult Life. I wrote that for a psychiatrist at the University of Pennsylvania. Well, I was I'm in glad- 
I was writing I'm, books. Pay me 10,000 bucks at that time. I would write your book. Now it's a much different fee. I wrote DeLuca's book, the found, co-founder of Subway. And that was a $100,000 uh, advance from uh, Warner Books when I did that in 2000. So, you know, I kind of, I, I wanted to find, I was a college professor making no money. And I needed to, I needed something to freelance. Writing books for business people was perfect for me. Spend six months working on a topic. They paid me $10,000. I wasn't making much more than that as an assistant professor at Temple University teaching full time. So I was almost doubling my income by writing one book. But I would write two, three books a year um, on that kind of a. Well, basis. I'm glad you chose franchising, not the, to become me. the expert in divorcing. That's yeah, exactly. <laughs> that was a bad topic. So uh, when my, did you first become a. When did you first become a franchisee? Were you a franchisee or did you work for franchisors first? Oh, no, I became, well, at first I started, you know, what, here's what happens when you become a world authority and, and people have no idea of history when they say, well, Trump invented fake news. No, it existed in 1979. Well, in 1981, when my book came out, fake news existed then because every radio station that would do a podcast like this with me, it was a phoner, you know, in those days, I would do four, four radio shows a day across the United States. And they would always, and I never told them how to, you know, I sent them the book or the PR company sent them the book with a little blurb about me. The blurb did not say that I was a world authority. Those radio station announcers would say, oh, what I already said to your audience, up next, the world authority on franchising. Media gave me that. Uh, so, yeah, I felt like an imposter because I would laugh and think if I'm an authority and I only, you know, I could hardly spell the word at the time, uh, you know, then they, they've got this all wrong. But I knew, knew more then about franchising than 90 percent of people because nobody to this day, nobody knows anything about franchising for the most part. You know, I, I just spoke at the Palm Beach Chamber of Commerce about franchising. And these are business people. And they really don't know about franchising. So, so many people don't. So many people don't know. I, I mean, I get invited to different places and there's just, people are always fascinated. Somebody that knows something about franchising and is able to kind of give real truth about it. Yeah, the stories uh, I can tell about, you know, people who have used franchising to build their personal wealth and to build their empires. You know, I, I can go story after story after story, which is part of what I did in my keynote at the Palm Beach Chamber because people, and these are people who live in this community who I can, you know, a guy who has 260 Wendy's, but came from Cuba. You know, he is an immigrant, his family emigrated to the country. How'd they Changed do that? His life. Changed yeah. his life. Yeah. Well, um, tell us about Homevestors. Were you, were you a, and which is We Buy Gly Houses. Like yeah. how, did, how Another, did you, how did you get involved with them? That was in 2000. So. Uh, I was living in Dallas at the time. Uh, I'd been working in franchising. I'd already sold my marketing business. I was writing and speaking about franchising pretty much on a full-time basis. I had a few clients I was doing some work with. And out of the blue, I got a call. Homevestors was based in Dallas. And the founder of the company had sold about 20 franchises. And like all emerging franchisors, didn't know what he was doing. Not all emerging franchisors don't know what they're doing. But he had... You know, he had his hands full. Now that I've got 20 franchisees, what do I do? Help. I don't have a good training program. I don't have a good support program. I don't have a franchise advisory council. Um, am I charging the right franchise fee? I'm, you know, I'm going broke training these franchisees. So he called me in and he said, I need you to help me with this, this, this. And I said, okay. And I went back to him and I, I said, well, there's about $100,000 worth of work here that you need me to do. And it's going to take me four to six months to do that work. And he said, which I already knew this, he said, I don't have $100,000 to, to spend. And I said, well, then we got a problem because, you know, I don't work for free, of course. And it wasn't like that, you know, it wasn't- uh, it wasn't it, quite it, that it wasn't, direct. Yeah, it wasn't that direct, but he, you know, I mean, I'm trying to get to cut to the chase. And so uh, I said, I, I, I'll tell you, uh, uh, Ken, he, he was a great, great guy. We became really close friends. And I said, I'll tell you what, I've not done this before. 
because it's not a, a good way to run my business. I would like to have a, a franchise in Dallas, a Homevestors franchise in Dallas, and I um, won't pay the franchise fee. There's twenty five thousand, and I won't. Um, I don't want to pay five thousand dollars a month, which every franchisee had to do to pay for the billboards. The billboards drove two hundred fifty thousand leads a year from people who said, uh, "I want to buy. Uh, I have an ugly house. Will you come and buy it from me?" So um, he said, "Okay, great." And so he ended up paying me, uh, I, I think maybe forty thousand in cash, and the rest he gave me in credits. Best decision I had made. Well, best decision I made was to get on Don Dwyer's board of directors when it was the Dwyer group <laughs> before it became neighborly because that came with options. Second best was oh, yeah, to make yeah, that yeah. deal with Ken D'Angelo, uh, who who was who's now deceased, unfortunately. Great human being, honest. He, every franchisor should be as good. If he took twenty five thousand from you. He wanted to give you $75,000 worth of value in training and support. If you had a problem and you needed help, he wasn't going to send an ops guy. He was going to say, uh, Eric, what are you doing Tuesday? Pick me up at the airport. I'll come in and spend two days with you. We're going to figure it out. And I've made many of those trips with him, which is how I learned about uh, the business. And then um, I got on his board as I learned more and more because, you know, you, you hang out with franchisees as I was doing. You you just pick up a lot of oh, yeah. wow this is how this business works so then he uh, you know he pointed me to his board of directors which was great um, and then he announced one day I've got cancer and I'm going to die and I said he was a great kidder he loved Vegas loved gambling wasn't always very good at it but sometimes he hit really <laughs> good. and we had great times together and um, uh, he said no I'm I've got um, uh, there's no cure for what I've got. And he was dead in four months. And so mm. on his deathbed one night, he said to me at the hospital, my family and I want you to succeed me as the CEO of Homevest. I said, Ken, I, I love you. And I can't do that. I'm not you. I don't know anything about real estate. Uh, and you didn't really have to know about real estate because we were real estate investors. And he said, look, we've already discussed it. We trust you. I don't have much time and uh, I, and what time I have left, I'm not coming into the office. And um, so I'll coach you as best I can. Uh, this was in, uh, this was in October or November. He died in January. Hmm. So finally I realized sitting in the, in the hospital, you can't tell your best friend, you can't help him on his deathbed. So even though it was a big ask and I didn't even have time to say to my wife, hey, this is an opportunity. I said to him, Ken, I don't want you to worry about the business. I'll go in tomorrow and I'll, I'll start. I'll take over. I didn't ask how much am I going to get paid. You're going to give me any of your stock. I didn't. You, know, this you just my did plan. it. I just so did it. when you were in it and you, know, you knew it from a franchising, helping them, helping them out, what, looking back, what kind of takeaways would, did you have or do you have that would be helpful to an emerging brand or a growing brand or a franchisee that is part of an emerging or a growing brand? The great thing about Ken, the great thing about Dwyer, uh, the great thing about so many others who, uh, a Butch Mogavero, who's not my client, but he's on my advisory board at uh, the Titus Center. And I hope to write a book with him. Uh, the great thing about so many of these emerging, and, and Butch is not emerging anymore. He's really out there. Uh, but there are a lot of them, you know, I've, I've known them in their infancy. I knew uh, Gary Finley growing Restoration One when he bought the first one in Florida. Um, and I've know, known Butch since, you know, the days when he's pinching pennies. Um, he, he, number one, make sure you understand how franchising works. Most people don't. And Many franchisors don't know that in the beginning. And make sure that you understand when you take 25,000 or 50,000 or 10,000 or whatever your franchise fee is, when you take that money from someone, they expect you to make them successful. And if you can't do that, then don't take the money. And the worst thing 
you can say, and I've seen franchisors say this, and I've had franchisees tell me, I called them to say I needed help, franchisee is telling me. And they said, look, I, I've got my own business, my own in my three outlets that I'm running. Uh, I'll get to you next week. Well, that's not a, that's not an an that's an answer, but that's that's not right. So Ken D'Angelo, Don Dwyer would would drop whatever they were doing, and they would go personally help that franchisee. Um, and you, as a an emerging franchisor, you've got to be willing to step out of what you've been doing for the last five, 10, 20 years, building your business. You got to be willing to step out of that and step into the franchisee's world. And if you're not, you're not a good franchisor and you shouldn't be doing it. It's interesting because uh, I know, you know, Gary and Butch and Gary's such a fantastic guy. He just wrote a new book. Was it the Redneck? The Redneck, Redneck CEO. Yeah. CEO. He's going to be on, on the podcast and he did. He built them. Um, they're both from Waco, the Waco area. And you they know, all come from Dwyer. Yeah, all the yeah, exactly. And but yeah, they all have that Dwyer DNA. And Butch, I've been with him, and he'll get a call from a franchisee, and he's like, Eric, I'm gonna go, I'm gonna go visit Absolutely. them. And they're Absolutely. they're not at a cool place to go visit. So, you know, he's like, he's goes to North Dakota or wherever it is, and I'll call him like Butch, where are you? And he's right. He's like, like you just said, and, and um, he's got uh, Boulder uh, design and border magic, both, you know, great brands and just a great guy. But how do you know, how do you know the founder has that DNA? The founder is so passionate about their franchisees being successful. Everyone yeah. says they are, but how, yeah. how do you know? Well, I think I can know by give me 10 minutes talking to you and I'll figure it out. Uh, you know, it's, there, there, there's not a test you can give them. Um, but I emphasize that point to new franchisors that you're, you're cheating franchising, you're cheating yourself. And shamefully, you're taking money from somebody who may be spending everything they have to get into your business. Good franchisors and franchisees that are getting into a business should be both be thinking ROI. What kind of ROI can I get on my invest initial investment and my yeah. royalty payment every every month? And yeah. the franchisor should be thinking, how can I give them an ROI? As they, you know, in, in the investing world, as the person taking money, you want yeah. to deliver an ROI. So yeah. I don't think that that's probably talked about enough or viewed uh, by both the franchisee and the franchisor enough like that. They they no. both see it as an a, a line item on the on the income statement or an expense. But even before that, not every franchisee and not every franchisor is created equally. There are people who buy franchises and shame on the franchisor for selling it to them. But in some cases, again, I think I say shame on the franchisor for selling it to them because there are people who will not succeed in a franchise in spite of how much money they have and who they are. And I'll give you a good example. I didn't really understand that until I took over from Ken D'Angelo at Homevestors. And the first thing I asked for, at the time there were 225 franchisees in 32 states. And so I went, one of my first requests, I went to the uh, accounting, our accounting department at Homevestors and I said, I want you to give me an itemized a prioritized list of the franchisees in rank order of who paid us the most money in royalties last year, providing they were a franchisee for at least a year. So give me a rank ordered list of who paid us the most money. And when the list came back, uh, I said to the leadership team that I inherited, about 10 people sitting around the conference room, these were Ken's people, um, who knows all of the top 10 on this list? No one did. 10 people on the leadership team. No one knew the top 10 best customers. These were franchisees who never called the corporate office because they didn't need any help, or we assume they didn't need any help. They sold a hundred house, they they bought a hundred houses a year, and they sold maybe that many unless they kept one or 20 of them for their own rental portfolio. 
Uh, these were people who were not crybabies. These were people who Ken taught how to be franchisees and they just went and did it and paid us the most money every year. And we didn't know who they were. We weren't taking them to dinner. We weren't sending them Christmas presents. So then I said, let's look at the bottom 25, not 10, the bottom 25, the people who pay us the least money. Does anybody here know all 25 of them? About five hands went up because those are the crybabies. Those are the people who will never be successful franchisees and home investors, but we sold them a franchise. And the five people who knew them were the, the uh, ops people, uh, the uh, franchise mentors, the franchise, the field people. Everybody knew them because these are the people who call every week and tell us home investors sucks. You people don't know what you're doing. This doesn't work. That doesn't work. You took my money. You stole from me. These are people who would not validate. So out of our FDD, if a prospect called one of those bottom 25, they weren't going to hear a good story about us. So then I went back to the, to my, to the operations with department with that list. And I said, I want you to take this list and I want you to give me the disc profile. Ken, for some reason, it wasn't called a disc profile, but it was the disc profile. It was called something else. It was red, yellow, blue, green. And disc, uh, it's the disc profile, but in a, different, um, in a different look. And for whatever reason, somebody had convinced Ken <laughs> to give every franchisee this profile. And he did. And he had that information. Uh, and every time they sold a franchise, franchisees filled out this profile. And so I said, I want you to give me this list back with everybody's disc profile. So then I looked at the top 10. Well, the top 50, they all had D in the first or second position of their profile. Then I looked at the bottom 50. There were no D in the bottom. They had no D. Okay, there was my answer. So I went to the sales department, said, hey, fellas, don't bring me a franchise agreement to sign unless they have D <laughs> in the first or second position. And they looked at me like I was crazy. And at that time, our franchise fee was $50,000. And they looked at me like, what are you talking about? If they don't have D in the first or second, we will not sell them a franchise because they're going to end up in the bottom 50, where we're going to spend all our money trying to train, retrain, retrain, support, 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 and these are not people who can buy ugly houses and be successful because they don't have D in their personality. The only way I'll sign that agreement is if they put somebody, uh, they have a partner with at least 10% ownership in the company who is a D personality. Okay. Because without D, you can't buy an ugly house. I cannot come yep, into your yep. house and tell you, while every other house on your street is selling for $150,000, I'm going to buy your house for $80,000. You're probably in Texas going to pull a gun and want to shoot me, or you're going to run me out of your house. People without a D, they don't know how to do that. They can't do that. They can't take that risk. That's too big of a risk. But people with a D know what they're doing. They don't mind telling you, your house is worth to me $80,000. I'll buy it from you cash within seven days. You're that makes sense out. because, you know, even just looking at the, the disc profile, I'm high D, high I, low S, low C. Like it's just, you know, you're a great home investors. You're a great prospect <laughs> for a home investors franchise. I should have bought a home investors. I, I, I first had my little lawn business as a high D go in and I walk away from a lawn owning this lady's house that she no. basically gave to me no. paying 20 years on the mortgage. And I put that into my first franchise and been successful in franchising. But, you know, as and you were talking how about Ken D'Angelo got into home investors, is it really a lady essentially gave him the house? <laughs> he was a, he was a realtor in Dallas and she kept begging him sell my house. Well, the house was ugly. He was too polite to say, ma'am, you got an ugly house. I can't sell this house. You got to fix it up. It needs a roof, needs windows, needs this, needs painted, needs carpet. She had no money. So she essentially said, you know, I'll give it to you if you'll take this house. He put $15,000 into it, put it on the market, sold it at full price 
in like five days. He said, forget being a real estate broker, putting up with realtors who, who are complaining, whining every day. I don't need to deal with realtors. I'm going to get into the investment business. And, you know, he was doing a hundred houses a year. Oh yeah. No, I mean, I, I, I love, I mean, I was early on in Liberty tax and I saw homebesters and they were, you know, they were in Austin. They were near where we were with Liberty tax, but I love what you said, just how your mindset was Give me the top 10. Nobody knew who they were. And yeah. I, you know, I, I wrote down, like, as you said that there are low maintenance, high performers, you yeah. know, and how many franchisors have low maintenance, high performers that your ops team don't know, or how many of you franchisors have low maintenance, high performers that you haven't had a conversation with to learn from or glean from no or thank them. them. Yep. If they're not complaining, why would I need to talk to them? Why, why would I need to call them? Meanwhile, I got a list of 10 people who are beating me up here and making it hard for me to sell franchise. I got to go deal with them. No, you need to get rid of those people. Get rid of those, but but why, why talk to them? Like what's, what are the benefits from a franchise or having relationship with the high performers? Yeah. If you got a five-year agreement, just count the days until the five years is up and let them know six months out, you will not be renewing them or go to them now and offer to help them sell their franchise. You're talking about the bottom performers. You're talking about the bottom performers. Bottom performers. Yeah. Those those you don't want. The top people, you know, if you don't know about lifetime value of a customer, you're messing up. And by ignoring those people, you're messing up in a major way. So and lifetime it, value of bottom performers versus top performers is night and day. So as a franchisor, you should always be looking at the lifetime value of a franchisee. Go deeper into that. Yeah. So, you know, when you start thinking about, wow, if I got a guy who's just been a, he's been my customer, my fran- and franchisees are customers. He's my customer for just a year and he's already buying 22 houses this year, or he's, he's doing whatever he's running a UPS store and he's better than, you know, the average franchisee who's been in it for three years or five years. You got to figure out, you got to look at those people. And then we'd say, you know, if I, if I really encourage this fellow, he's going to buy a hundred houses a year. He buys a hundred houses a year, man. He's, he's, he's hitting his numbers personally. He's going to think I walk on water. And I'm going to invest in that guy. Plus, he's got the right profile. If he doesn't have the right profile, there's no sense trying to help him. You're not going to help him. You're, it's, you're going to be beating your head against a wall. And most franchisors, by, by the way, they don't know the profile of the best customer. That's a shame. But most franchisors are afraid to use these profiles because they'll say, well, I need, I need to sell it. I'll, I'll teach him. I'll teach him how to do it. What he doesn't have, I'll, no, you won't. If he doesn't have... Whatever the profile of your top people is, and it might not be a DI, it might be an SC, or it might be a CD. If you don't know what that profile is, and you're just selling franchises, you you don't have any hope of developing lifetime value out of these top people. And you won't do it with the bottom people. So you've got to look at, I don't want this franchisee for five years or 10 years, whatever the length of your agreement is. I want them for a lifetime. All right. And over a lifetime, Look how much money, because you don't have to put anything into this guy. He goes out and buys 100 houses a year, pays you the royalty, and will do other things with you as well. He'll probably help you sell five more franchises. That's That adds to the lifetime value. Maybe I ought to give him a wrapped F-150 pickup truck at my convention. We gave a lot of those away. We gave those to our best customers. And I mean, you can't imagine what that does to 500 people sitting in your, at your convention and you're giving away F-150s to three people, five people or whatever it might be. Uh, you know, we're not, it's nice to give trophies, but everybody's got trophies nowadays. Uh, giving, give them some, it's nice to give trips, but that doesn't do it like an F-150 in our business um, did it. So you're going to get that back because they go out and help you sell five franchises. And what's the the value? You got a $50,000 franchise fee and they're helping you sell five and they're not getting a commission because they're not in your FDD. It's that's, that's not, there's nothing to disclose there about them helping you. They're helping you because they're now multimillionaires because of your business and they don't mind giving you the credit. I had uh, two budget blinds franchisees in front of my class yesterday, seven years in the business. They could not, 
they could not get over the support that they get from budget blinds corporate and said, because of that, we are one of the most successful franchisees in the network. Um, you know, this is what you want to hear. So, so I know one of the, the largest budget blinds franchisee is in my franchisee mastermind, the franchise tribe mastermind has yeah. great things to say about budget blinds. I have another one that's with shelf genie. And I don't normally drop this many franchise or names in there, but I think it's important. And there was Shelf Genie and another emerging brand. And he's like, it's just night and day, the support and the way that they're treated um, with a larger brand. And it doesn't need to be that way. That's not saying a larger brand is always going to do that by any means. But, but, you know, you hear some of these brands like this that you and I know, we hear things from franchisees, that means a lot. And those are, you know, two big ones right there, but they provide a lot of, a lot of help to their franchisees. They view them the right way. And I hear a lot of negatives from franchisees, but. Oh, yeah. My, in the back of my mind, and sometimes I don't get involved because there's no vested, I have no, you know, it's not my client, a franchisee's venting to me. Well, in the back of my mind is I'd love to see your profile. And if you tell me what, you know, I know what the business is. I don't know the profile of every franchise opportunity, but I can figure it out. If sales is involved and you don't have D in the personality, you shouldn't be a franchisee in that network. And I can figure out by talking to people what their personality profile, usually I can figure it out. And I know if this is a high S personality, they're risk adverse. They're not going to sell anything. They're not going to be on the front line. For <laughs> they probably won't even buy. <laughs> they shouldn't even be buying a franchise. Uh, uh, well, the C's won't buy. If you're no. a high C and you, you're a franchisor and you come to me with a high C personality, I'm going to tell you, save your breath. They're not going to buy. They're going to keep kicking the tires. Three years from now, they'll be kicking the tires. C's, high C's are not going to buy because everything has to be perfect for the high C. They're going to keep investigating, investigating, investigating. They know the other shoe's going to drop. They just have to find it and ask them for their social security number. No way they're going to give you the social security number. They won't even give you the last four. They won't even give you the last four. No, they don't want to tell you their phone number. They'll transpose numbers. They're not going to give you their email because you're going to bug them. All right, this is a high C. So if you're a high, so anybody out there that's thinking about buying a franchise, Go out there, take the free disc profile, yeah. a personality profile. And if you're a high C, just, you know, just know yourself, know what your own limitations are and know what's probably going to happen. Uh, do you have a site to send them for a free disc profile? I, I don't. Have... I probably should. Okay. Well, send them to howtobuyafranchise.com and just click on the disc profile. It's free. They'll get information from me directly. And uh, they that's all they got to do. There's there's no obligation. There's no uh, nothing to, you know, no fee involved. I should do that. I should get one that says franchise secrets forward slash disc yeah. or yeah. franchise disc profile or something. But yeah, yeah. go check out. You can go send check them it right out. to my, you go can check it out. You can and, piggyback and, and, on, and, my, uh, on my disc. I'm happy to. Because, you know, you got to give them, they get a letter by email telling yep. them, here's your profile is, and here's what it means. It comes from me. And so let me ask you this, and we're good about ready to wrap up here, but people that you thought would be a bad franchisee turned out to be a great franchisee. How often does that happen? And how does that, how does a franchisor kind of get over that? Because back in, you know, when I was doing so much franchise development, we're like this one. Is going to be great, and they yeah, were not so great, wrong. right? Yeah. So you're how do you reconcile on that one? The ones that you think are going to be great aren't. The ones that you think sometimes they become, and again, to me, it's not. It's there's no mystery. Show me the profile. Tell me the business. You know, if it's a uh, if it's a business where they got to be concerned about quality, like uh, home care, or, mm -hmm. or children's education, or tutoring, you could you got to. You need to be an S and some C in that personality. Um, you don't want the high D necessarily as your franchisee uh, there. So tell me the business, show me the candidate's profile, and um, 
it's not a mystery to me that this is going to be a good franchise. That's an interesting one. I think one of the one of the takeaways on that is to know what the business really is. Because home care depends what you're going to be doing, what your role is. It might be all sales, or it might be taking, you know, taking care of the, the caregivers, you know, ma- managing the caregivers, two different sides of that business. Tax business, it was not a, you don't need to know taxes. I didn't know taxes, but right. I knew marketing. I knew sales and I could, and I, and I grew up in that. And I, I learned how to do that because it was part I knew of my nothing DNA. about real estate. You know, I was not, uh, I don't have a real estate license. Uh, you don't need to know about real estate mm-hmm. to be at that time. Anyway, a home investors franchisee, um, and, and you weren't selling, you were actually selling your opportunity to buy somebody's ugly house. Yep. So know uh, what your know what the business really is. When you're validating with franchisees, ask them like, who are the best franchisees? Are they good at sales? Are they good at, you know, what are they really good at? And ask them their disc profile, for goodness sake. You, even if the franchisor doesn't know any of this stuff, you can ask them. And a lot of people know their disc profile and you can start to understand who you're talking to in a validation aspect as well. Yeah. All right, man. Any last bits, nuggets of wisdom that you have for the audience, uh, given your you know tremendous background and such a, a, a you know deep background in franchising, as the world-renowned expert, that's really true now. Yeah, thank you. Well, franchising is the best way for the average individual or mom and pop. You know, I don't use that in a in a negative mm-hmm. way. People who want to open a business and are a little risk averse, perhaps, um, not, not sure of themselves. They're not uh, entrepreneurs. Uh, maybe they've been, you know, they've been in a job for 30 years and now they wanna go out on their own and they need somebody to help them. Franchising is the answer, but there are 4,000 franchise opportunities in North America. They're not all created equal. They're not all cut from the same cloth. And just because your brother-in-law is succeeding in franchise A doesn't mean you'll succeed in franchise A. Your brother-in-law has a different personality than you. So you've, you've, you've got to do, if you do the due diligence, there is a franchise most likely for you, but you've got to do the due diligence, beginning with knowing your profile. And ah, I love it. I love it because we've never gotten into this type of thing on the Franchise Secrets podcast before. So I'm glad we went into the areas that we did because I think it serves the audience well. Well, thank you for coming on. Hey, thank you. Thanks for listening to this episode of the Franchise Secrets podcast. Whether you're watching or listening, please make sure to subscribe to my YouTube channel and to whatever channel you're listening on. If you want my help with anything from buying a franchise to franchising your business, please visit FranchiseSecrets.com.